Okay, good morning. Um, okay, so uh, uh, last time we, uh, most of the lecture we spent uh, um, talking about mappings and at the end of the lecture we started uh, talking about uh, configuration manifolds and um, uh, we'll uh, continue that again uh, um, today. So, um, so remember we were talking about the idea of an interconnected mechanical system and, and the idea was that we have M sub P uh, particles. Okay, so again, a particle you should think of as being a, a point mass uh, and M sub B uh, rigid bodies. Okay, uh, and then um, we had a, a free configuration space uh, of R3 to the M sub P. Okay, so M sub P copies of R3 uh, cross um, SO3 uh, cross R3, and there was M sub B uh, copies of that. Okay. Um, and so the idea with the free configuration space, um, it's not a, a, a thing per se, because it doesn't say very much about your system. All it really tells you is that you have M sub B particles and M sub B bodies. Um, uh, and then R3 tells you to locate a particle, you use R3. Uh, um, um, and remember we talked last time about you know, um, spatial origins and body origins and things like this. Um, and then uh, for each body, uh, we locate it by an element of SO3 cross R3. So the R3 is a vector which goes from um, the spatial origin to the body origin. And then uh, uh, SO3 gives us the orientation of the uh, body frame relative to the spatial frame. And we have an exact recipe for, which, which we'll see how it works out in examples today, an exact recipe for how you sort of build uh, um, uh, descriptions of this, okay? Um, and so uh, um, now um, what we will do is we'll talk about uh, an interconnected mechanical systems, a system. So now we add interconnections. Okay, and so the idea is, and again, well, this this will become uh, transparent when we talk about examples. But let's try to understand in generality kind of what's going on. So the idea is is that each uh, uh, body um, or particle uh, may be uh, its its uh, configurations may be constrained uh, either relative to some other of the particles and rigid bodies or with respect to space itself. Okay, uh, so a common kind of a thing uh, that can happen is, you know, you might study uh, a system which is um, restricted to planar motion, right? So what that means is that there's some two-dimensional plane in inside your space uh, um, and, and all your bodies and particles are restricted to move in that plane. So that's, you know, uh, an example of a constraint that comes from an interconnection. Um, and another kind of interconnection would be that if you have a physical joint between one part of one body and another part of of uh, another body, okay? And so, um, so we constrain the M sub P particles and the M sub B rigid bodies to move on some subset Q of Q free, okay? Um, and, and so, you know, the, the, the constraints of the kind that I just talked about, for each of the particles and bodies, uh, uh, there's gonna be some restriction on, um, um, the elements of R3 uh, uh, and the elements of R3 cross SO3 uh, to describe how your uh, interconnections evolve. And so we're going to assume that Q um, is uh, a submanifold.
of Q free. Okay. All right. So Q free um, is a manifold. Okay. So how is it a manifold? We should just think about this for a second. So um, we know that each R3 uh, and each SO3 are themselves manifold. And so really the only question to think about here is whether uh, products of manifolds are manifolds. Okay. Um, and if you think about it for a second, that's more or less obviously true. If you have an atlas for, uh, uh, for a manifold M and you have a, an atlas for a manifold N, then the products of the charts uh, form an atlas for the product M cross N. And so products are manifolds in a fairly obvious way. And you have to you know, verify that uh, the thing that I just described is actually an atlas, which again amounts to verifying the overlap conditions. And, and that just follows in a straightforward way from the fact that each of the atlases on the components of the product satisfy the overlap conditions, okay? Um, all right, so uh, uh, so interconnected mechanical systems, we're going to make this submanifold assumption. All right, so in the examples that we're going to look at, you'll kind of see how that's a natural thing uh, to think about, but it's also natural for it to not happen. Um, uh, and the way that it can not happen, uh, uh, so the way that it would, so you know, submanifolds as we've seen are you know kind of manifolds sitting inside other manifolds. All right, so. Um, and so they're nice and smooth, right? Manifolds to us are, you know, kind of smooth surfaces in some way. Um, uh, uh, and so, but it's possible that your uh, subset uh, Q, which sits inside Q free, may not be, you know, smooth. It may have uh, sort of corners uh, on it, and that's not exotic. Um, and so, for example, if you, uh, so you know, if I was live in the classroom, this would be easier to illustrate. Um, uh, but if you, uh, so maybe let me try to draw uh, this. Um, so this um, can easily not happen. Okay, so let's maybe think about a, a particle. Okay, and so, and we'll just have a simple particle, which is uh, uh, constrained to move in a box. Okay. All right, so we have a particle which moves around in here. Okay. Um, and so obviously the uh, uh, Q, is going to be, and let's say that this part of the box is uh, some interval. Um, uh, um, uh, a, B, and this part of the box is some interval C, D. Okay, and so Q is sort of you know going to be uh, A, B, cross C, D. Okay, and so. Uh, All right, so um, uh, this is actually not a manifold. And so and why is it not a manifold? Well, remember one of the uh, properties of a manifold. So this thing is sort of, you know, two dimensional. So, okay, so it's fine. We're moving around inside. Um, um, but then, you know, if your particle comes along, it, it's moving in this two dimensional um, interior of the box. And then if it comes in contact with the wall, okay, and then, you know, moves along the wall, well, the wall now becomes this kind of one dimensional boundary. Uh, to the you know two dimensional interior and manifolds as we've defined them do not allow for this. Okay, you can talk about manifolds in that sense, but our definition of manifolds do not allow for uh, uh, um, you know sort of the uh, uh, dimensions of which the thing can move uh, to kind of change instantaneously, such as when you come in contact with a wall like this. Okay, um, and so it's not difficult to come up with examples of systems which uh, um, are not uh, interconnected in this in this uh, definition that um, um, uh, the set of admissible configurations is a submanifold okay but we're always going to assume that right so maybe it's best uh, to look at simple examples okay all right um, 
so the, the, some of these examples that we're going to carry uh, 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 along with us, and so they're going to be kind of simple examples, because as we will see later on in the course, some of the uh, things that we'll construct are actually kind of a little bit computationally messy, so they can't be done very easily in class. So the examples we're going to use to illustrate things in class are more or less going to be simple. Okay. All right. So uh, the first one we'll look at is a planar rigid body. Okay, so this is just what the words say. This is a planar, uh, a rigid body, which is constrained to move in a plane. Okay, so what does that mean? So that means that uh, 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 there's kind of a, a point in the body, uh, and that point is in the plane, um, and uh, the body can't rotate about, uh, so the only rotations the body can make are about an axis which is orthogonal to the plane. Okay, so the, when the body rotates, it has to rotate in the plane, so that means about an axis orthogonal to the plane. Okay, so it has, of the three possible kinds of rotations that it can do, um, it can only do one of them, okay? Um, and that's uh, about an axis uh, orthogonal to the plane of motion, all right? Um, and so remember that the modeling process uh, that we use here is we first choose a spatial frame. And so we're going to assume that the plane, obviously, is kind of the plane of the paper here, or the, the tablet that I'm writing on, okay? So, so the... Um, 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 so this is the plane, okay? So it's moving in that plane. All right, so the first uh, thing I need to do, and the first thing you always do, is you choose a spatial frame, okay? Now, um, uh, the choice of a spatial frame is in some sense completely arbitrary, but you can make your life easier or harder by choosing um, smarter or stupider spatial frames. In this case, there's a very obvious uh, uh, spatial frame. So what, what properties do you think my spatial frame should have? Um, the plane parallel to um, the span of two. That's right. So things. two of my, so remember a spatial frame we sort of specified with an S1, S2, S3. So the first thing we're going to ask is we're going to ask that the spatial origin be in the plane. Okay, it doesn't have to be, it could be outside the plane. Um, and then the second thing, and this is the, the one that you were uh, concentrating on, um, uh, is that uh, two of the um, uh, um, basis vectors for our uh, spatial frame should lie in the plane. So this plane is kind of you know generated by them. So this is S1, let's say, and this is S2. Again, you could make them different. Um, and then uh, the way I've drawn it, S3 would come out of the, uh, um, would come out of the, um, um, the tablet that I'm writing on, okay? So there's the spatial frame, okay? So now I have a body that moves in the plane. So let me draw my body in a sort of specific kind of a way simple sort of way of representing the body so that its orientation is clear. Um, and so I need to choose a, 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 a body frame as well. Um, and, you know, there's, and so we'll see later on that there's an obvious place to put all spatial frames and that's at a point in, uh, in the body, which is called the center of mass of the body. But we don't know what the center of mass is yet. So um, um, we won't talk about it like so, but we'll put a frame here, which will be O body, will be the origin. And then sticking out of the frame will be, and then uh, B3, Will come out of uh, will come out of the plane, okay, and uh, so the body moves in such a way uh, that B three always remains sticking out of the plane, okay. That's what it means to be planar motion, okay. Um, uh, so now what? Uh, so we know what Q free is. What's Q free? Oops. That's Q free. So what's Q free in this example? Is it the same? 
Yeah, but what's uh, so what's so what's the only thing that I need to specify here? I need to specify just MP and MB, right? Because that's uh, oh. uh, um, and what's MP? The number um, of particles. Zero. Yeah, and then one body. Okay, so in other words, it's yeah. just SO three cross R three. Okay, so so this this is very uh, uh, this is a kind of an elementary part of the process uh, at every stage. It's just counting. Okay, um, so now uh, we should write down what Q is. Okay, so Q uh, is going to be uh, a collection of, it's going to be a point in SO3 cross R3, okay, so it's going to be a, um, an R and a little r, okay, so we're going to write uh, um, elements of uh, uh, the describe describe the orientation of bodies by r uh, and then um, uh, the the vector from the uh, uh, spatial origin to the body origin that's going to be a little r that's all that's kind of the notation we'll use okay <clears throat> all right so now uh, I need to just kind of tell you what these things look like uh, for the constraint of planar motion. All right, so I need to write down what R looks like. Okay, so that's, we just follow the recipe for building R. So R we know is going to be a three by three matrix. Okay, and the way you build R is that you, um, uh, is that you prescribe, uh, you assemble into the columns of R, one, two, three, uh, you assemble the components of B1, relative to S1, S2, S3, uh, the components of B2 relative to S2, S1, S2, S3, and then the components of B3, okay? So this is kind of just elementary, you know, planar trigonometry, right? Um, and so we kind of need something here uh, to uh, allow us to write these things down, and that will be this angle, which I'll call theta, okay? And theta will be chosen so that, you know, B1 is measured, uh, um, uh, you know, we're going to kind of rotate B1 by an angle theta uh, from S1, and that's going to sort of fix how we describe um, R, okay? All right, so then remember, the, the rule is, is that in the first column of this matrix, I put the components of B1 in the S1, S2, S3 spatial frame. What's the B, what's the S1 component of B1? Yellow. Anybody? One zero zero. Uh, the all right. So what am I? Um, um, thank you. Uh, so uh, so what am I doing here? I'm taking the vector b one and I'm writing the components of b one in this frame. So what is the S1 component of the vector B1? So B1 and B2 and B3 are unit length. S1, S2, S3 are unit length. So what's oh, the sorry, S1, S1 dot B1? Yeah, which is exactly Inner what in product. terms of this. Say again? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, but there's a simple way of expressing that inner product in terms of this theta. B1 cos theta? theta? Yes, exactly, cos theta, thank you. Okay, I mean you're right. It, this is this is exactly just the inner product of uh, 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 B1 with S1. It just it's it's just cosine uh, cosine theta. And then what about the uh, S2 component of B1? Sine theta. Thank you. And then the S3 component. Zero. Zero. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then I do the same thing for B2. And so the uh, S1 component of B2 is. Sine theta. Except there's a minus sign, right? Because yeah. it's pointing, it's pointing in that direction. Okay, so it's minus sine theta and then cosine theta. Um, and then uh, zero again. All right. And then finally for uh, B3, uh, what are the components of B3 in the S1, S2, S3 frame? Zero, zero, one. Thank you. Okay. All right, so that's what R looks like. 
Okay. Um, uh, and here, uh, theta can be any real number. It, you know, you may as well just go from uh, minus pi to pi. Uh, but you know, the form of R um, um, as an element of uh, SO three looks like that for any real number theta. Or sorry, yeah, any real number theta. So what about little r? What will little r look like? So little r is going to be a vector in R three. What will that vector look like? Okay, so remember that it's just going to be a vector here. So you know it's going to have just really one property. What property? Uh, what do I know about the components of this vector? Zero on the third component. That's right, and otherwise completely arbitrary, right? So x, y. Oh, sorry, it doesn't look like much like a y. Okay, All right, and here uh, x y are again arbitrary real numbers okay so that's uh, um, how i uh, parameterize uh, my uh, uh, configuration space for the system all right i write everything as an element of q free right and that's kind of how we're going to think about our configuration manifolds is they're going to be all sitting inside q free so we write down q free then what we do is we just sort of write down all the big r's and little r's uh, corresponding to uh, uh, um, to the constraints that are imposed by the system okay good thank you all right another example so again the example's uh, simple um, Draw it big enough so I can squeeze all the crap onto it that I need to squeeze. Okay. Um, and so this example we looked at in the uh, um, first lecture. So it's a, a double pendulum. Okay. Is one way to think about it. Okay. And if you want to think about this as being a robot, you can do that. You can put a little hand on there, and it's just a, a very dull robot. Okay, but you can think of it that way. Um, okay, so again, the first thing we do is we write down Q free. So, what's that going to be? Okay, so again, Q free is just is mindless. Okay, all I need to do is identify these numbers. So what's, what are the number of particles in this example? You could, you know, you, you could think about maybe I'm recognizing these as particles, but it kind of doesn't make sense. So how many particles are there? Zero. Thank you. And how many bodies are there? Two. That's right. Okay. Um, thank you. So it's just SO3 cross R3 squared. Okay. And so I think of an element of Q free as looking like this R1, R1, R2, R2. Okay. Now to specify what that thing looks like, um, to specify how to write these things down explicitly, uh, I need to go through the whole rigmarole of putting frames on, on here. Okay, so uh, uh, again, there's an arbitrary uh, choice here you can make for uh, spatial frames, but there's a natural one which makes sense. Well, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe there might be more than one, but in this case, I think everybody would kind of go with putting um, S1, S2. And then coming out of the page would be S3. Okay. All right. Now um, I also need to put body frames on here. All right. Um, so again, well, just as we did here, you kind of put a, a, a body origin somewhere um, uh, in a natural place on the body. Uh, and then you put a frame uh, at, at that um, origin for each body. And let's maybe uh, say that each of the bodies has a length, let's say this one has length L1, uh, and this one has the length uh, um, 
L2. Okay, and I put the bodies, sorry, CAC. And I put the bodies, uh, uh, the body frames um, at the midpoints, let's say, okay, just because I have to put them somewhere and that seems natural right now. Okay, and then I put frames on here. So I'm going to go B1, B2, and then B3 comes out of the page. And then, and so it's going to be B11 and B, sorry, one, two, uh, and then I have uh, B, two, one, and then similarly, and I'm not going to fill it in there because it's just going to get too messy. Uh, I have also B, two, two, uh, and then B, the B, threes come out of the page. All right. Okay, so now what I need to do is I need to, again, just like I did up here, you know, really writing down Q for Q is, is a subset of Q free, just amounted to specifying what these things look like. And I will do that here. Okay. Um, and to do that, I need to measure um, some angles. And I'll measure um, uh, two angles, theta one and theta two. All right. And I've shown there's choices you can make here now, right? So you could think about making theta two not be measured from the, sorry, the spatial S1 frame, but you could think of making theta two uh, as being measured from the, uh, uh, the, um, the first body's B1 frame, in which case you would be measuring, so um, just that angle there, okay? And you can definitely do that. Okay, um, you will end up with something which is different but equivalent, right? So you make these choices at the beginning um, and then you stick with them forever after, okay? All right, so uh, Q is going to be sorry, R1, R1. R2, R2, such that. All right, and so again, what I need to do is I need to specify what um, all these things look like, okay? So uh, let's write the big R's first, since these are the simplest. In fact, these are rather the same as what I did in, in this example, because I'm sort of doing for each body, I'm doing exactly the same thing uh, as I did up here in the single planar rigid body, okay? Um, uh, so it's gonna be the same thing with just uh, uh, theta one and theta two sitting in there, okay? So let me write it as uh, R sub A is cos, theta a sine theta a zero minus sine theta a cosine theta a zero 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 one. Okay, and a is one or two. Okay. All right, but remember that the, all I'm doing here is I'm simply for each body. So for B1, I'm taking, you know, um, uh, the first column here to be the components of B11. And then the second column are the components of B12. And then the, um, um, and then similarly for B21 and B22. Uh, uh, okay. And then both threes are exactly the same because the motion is planar. All right. Okay, now I need the little r's. Okay, so what I need to do now is I need to write the vectors from the spatial frame to the body frame. Okay, so for the first body, it's the vector from like so. Okay, so what will that be? What's the vector that goes from the spatial origin to the first body origin? Zero vector? From the spatial origin to the first body origin. 
Is this a circle? No, what I want to know that it's going to be a vector in R3. Okay, because that's what R's are. Little R's are always vectors in R3. So all you need to do is give me the components of that vector. Okay, to go from here to here. L1 over 2 cos theta 1. That's right. Okay. All right. Uh, and then R2. So I, I, need, I need now to do the same thing for, for, our, uh, for the second body. So it's, sorry. Okay, so it's going to be a vector now that goes from there to there. And of course, what we're going to do is we're going to write that vector as a sum of two vectors, like so. Okay, so what will this one be? Okay, so I have the vector, first vector, which goes from here to here. What's the S1 component of that vector going to be? L1 cos theta 1. Okay, and then I have this one here, and what will that one be? L2 over 2 cos theta 2. Thank you. Oh, sorry, L1. Okay. All right, so it's as simple as that. So, so uh, often um, this process is quite elementary. All right, so there's nothing here that's very exotic. You're just writing, doing elementary trigonometry. Okay. However, it's not that difficult uh, to come up with examples uh, where this requires a bit of thought. And, you know, just to sort of see why this is, it, we only need to look back at uh, uh, the first lecture where we talked about um, just a planar, sorry, a, a, a rigid body fixed at a point, and, but rotating about all the possible axes. And it's not entirely clear what the configuration space of that thing is. And only after some thought uh, were we able to sort of say that that's SO3. Okay, um, and so let's look at an example where uh, writing down Q as a subset of Q free um, uh, requires a, a, a little bit of thinking. Okay, and so the example is going to be what I'll call the rolling disk. Okay, and uh, so oops, try to draw it. Okay, so it's a disk which rolls on the on a on a plane. Okay, so uh, the disk rolls, and spins. But doesn't slip. Okay, and it remains, uh, and this is also important, um, and it, it remains upright. Okay, just to keep things simple. Okay. All right, so I have this plane P, and so the body uh, uh, rolls and spins. Okay, so let's see if we can try to figure out what the configuration space of this thing is. Well, uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to put our frames on there. Uh, so uh, spatial frame, what property do you think the spatial frame ought to have?
you think that's a good choice for a spatial frame? Um, is two one of the base perpendicular to the disk and is lying on the plane? Yeah, so it's rather the same thing as I had before. I should take the plane into account when I uh, uh, when I um, um, figure out what my spatial frame is. So I'm going to put the spatial origin on the plane. Then I'm going to choose my frame. Like so. Okay, so again, two of the vectors are in the plane, the other, and the other one's orthogonal. Okay, now um, uh, I have a body, and so the body is going to have a frame also. Okay, um, and it makes sense uh, to put the uh, uh, the origin for the body kind of at the rotational center of uh, of this disc. Okay. Um, you don't have to do that, but your life will be unenjoyable if you don't. Okay. Um, and so then I put uh, uh, um, the B1s, B2, B3 on here. And so I'm going to take B1 to kind of look like that. So the idea here, and so I'm going to draw sort of alternate views of this picture, will, which will make this uh, clearer. Right. And so B3 is kind of going to stick out of the disk and B1 and B2 are going to kind of be in the disk. Um, and so to describe uh, uh, how, how the disk rotates, I'm going to have this angle here, which is going to be, so it's going to be the angle from the, um, um, uh, from a vector parallel to the plane. So again, this will become clearer when when I, when I draw some pictures. Um, uh, it'll be a, the angle um, uh, from a vector parallel to the plane to B1, okay? Um, and I'm gonna call that angle, that's gonna be the um, uh, spin angle, and I'm gonna call that phi. And then I'm gonna have an angle here, which is going to be the, uh, sorry, I apologize, that's the roll angle. Okay, so as the disc rolls, uh, the phi changes, okay? Um, and then the spin angle I'm gonna call theta. Okay, all right, so this is quite complicated now. If you're gonna to try to write down uh, um, um, uh, the rotation matrix that's associated with, with this thing, because I kind of have two angles that I need to keep track of now, okay? All right, but let's do this systematically. So Q free, I have a single rigid body here, okay? And so Q free is just gonna be uh, SO3 cross R3. Um, and so an element of SO3 cross R3. I just write as R and R. Um, and so, as always, I'm going to specify now what uh, um, um, capital R and uh, little r look like. Okay. So, what does that mean? So, that means what you know to write down um, um, big R. What I need to do really is I need to write down the components of B1, B2, B3 relative to S1, S2, S3, and I need to put them in the columns of, uh, 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 of, of the matrix R. Okay, so this is a little bit complicated uh, um, because you have to keep track again of these two angles, theta and phi, the roll angle and the spin angle and the roll angle. And so maybe let's try to do this in a systematic kind of a way. All right. All right. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, rotate. the um, body frame into the spatial frame. And so build um, uh, R, okay? 
Um, you know, so the body frame and the spatial frame are related by some rotation. So in other words, there's a rotation R uh, uh, that you can do to convert the body frame into the spatial frame. And, th and that's what we're going to do. Okay, and we're going to do it by a series of three rotations, each of which is simple to understand. All right. And so I will represent this uh, by um, looking at the plane from above. Okay. Okay, so here's my plane P and I'm looking down on the uh, system. And so my spatial vectors look like this. And then S3 comes out of the plane, okay? And my body, uh, my disc is sort of configured like so. All right, and it's hard to tell from, um, 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 from this picture exactly what's going on. And, and this picture that I'm drawing now will make that much clearer. So here is my B3, which sticks out of the uh, uh, plane uh, uh, that the body rolls on. Um, and then I have these vectors uh, B1, B2, and B3. And these are kind of rotated uh, as the body spins. Um, and so uh, uh, B1 is gonna look like this. And then B2 is gonna look like this, okay? And so B1 and B2 are, are, are rotated. They're not parallel to the plane P and neither are they perpendicular to the plane P uh, uh, in general, okay? All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, set it up so that it, uh, the person can get rid of this uh, uh, spin angle. Um, and I'm going to rotate S1, S2, so that, so that it looks like this. Yeah, sorry. <sighs> okay. So this will be now B3, prime, okay. and this will be B1 prime, and this will be B2 prime, okay? And I will do this by a rotation, which I'll call R1, okay? Now, what's R1? Okay, R1 is now just a simple rotation about one of the spatial axes, about which spatial axis is R1 a rotation? S3. That's right. So I'm rotating now about S3. Okay. So I'm going to draw the right R1 down here. Okay. And um, is uh, uh, R1, um, so it's a rotation by what angle? Well, it's a rotation by the spin angle, right? So my angle here uh, is um, theta. Now, is this a positive or a negative rotation um, about S3 by theta? Okay, so to, to, to figure that out, you use the right-hand rule, okay? So S3 is sticking out of the plane here, if you can see me in my little thumbnail there, okay? And so, uh, right, so there's my positive rotation about uh, S3. Is this a positive rotation or a negative rotation? Okay, so right, so an S3 um, um, sticks out of the plane and positive rotations will go by the diagram um, uh, counterclockwise, okay? And so therefore this is a positive rotation by theta, right? So it's a positive rotation by theta about S3. We've already seen that, right? All of these examples, sorry, all of these examples up here, we had a positive rotation by, um, by theta one, um, about S3 and theta two, and then up here by uh, theta, okay? So we already know what uh, R1 will look like. It'll look like one of those things that we've already been talking about. So it's cos theta sine theta zero minus sine theta cos theta uh, zero and zero, zero, one. 
Okay, and so the idea is is that we've constructed this this new collection of vectors, b one um, prime, b two prime, b three prime, by rotating our original collection of vectors uh, by r one. Okay, and so the point is that uh, um, b a prime is equal to r one b a. Okay, does that make sense? Right. So now I need to do um, uh, another rotation. Okay, so my rotation here, there's many different ways to do this. Of course, they'll all give you the same thing in the end. Okay, so I still have my S1. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate so that B1 and B2, so that B1 is parallel to the plane, okay, and B1 is, or sorry, B2 is orthogonal to the plane, all right? So when I do that, B3 is still going to stick out here, so this is going to be what I'm going to call B3 double prime, okay? And now I'm going to rotate so that B1 is uh, parallel to the plane and B2 is sticking out of the plane, okay? All right. Now, so B, the reason I like doing these simple rotations is that they're just rotations about a single spatial axis. And so it's easy to write these rotation matrices down. Okay, so about which spatial axis is R2 a rotation? S2. That's right. Okay, so I'm rotating um, about uh, S2, right? So I'm rotating uh, B1 into kind of the vertical position, and I'm rotating, sorry, B2 into the vertical position, and B1 into a horizontal position, which is so B2 sticks out, and B1 is parallel to the plane. Okay. All right, so what will R2 look like? All right, so R2 is a rotation about S2. So what that means is that S2 is uh, uh, fixed. So I know, okay, just like in this example here, uh, because I was rotating about S3, I know what these parts are gonna look like. Here I'm rotating about S2, so I know what those parts are gonna look like. And so I need to fill in some, you know, cosine thetas and sine thetas in here. Okay, and to do that, um, I need to ask the question, uh, am I uh, making a positive rotation about S2 or a negative rotation about S2? Okay, so I'm rotating in this kind of diagram up here, I'm rotating B1 down so that it's parallel and I'm rotating B1 up so that it's uh, um, vertical. Okay, now, so is that a positive rotation by, uh, and, and the angle um, about which I make that rotation, of course, is the angle phi, all right? This, the, which is the roll angle. Now, so about S2, is that a positive or a negative rotation? Okay, just using the right hand rule. Okay, so you point your thumb along S2, uh, am I doing a positive or a negative rotation? If you choose to answer, you have a 50% chance of getting it correct. Positive. It's positive. Okay. So if you again, it's just if you do the right hand rule, uh, 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 you're you know you're rotating uh, B two from here up into the vertical position, and that's positive if you do the thumb and fingers business. Okay. Now. So what you, you know, by the same sort of reasoning we had here, uh, you have cos thetas, which are going to happen here, except they're going to be cos phi. Okay, and what you'd like to say um, 
uh, is you like to say that I have a minus sign phi here, right? You sort of like to go by analogy and say that uh, that minus sign here is analogous to putting a minus here because it's a positive rotation, right? If this was a negative rotation, right? I would have a minus here and a plus here. Um, and so you'd want to put a minus here and a plus here, but actually it turns out and we'll, we'll kind of see a, another manifest station of that this later on in the course it turns out that for the rotations about the spatial axis that above the diagonal you put the positive theta and then below the diagonal you put the negative sorry phi all right and you can just do the trigonometry to see why that's the case okay and the point is when i do this i get b a double prime is equal to uh, r uh, two b a prime okay um uh okay so i'm not going to try to speed through this um uh, uh um Actually, you know what? I take it back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this now uh, because I have everything here uh, and it and to break this would be uh, bad. Um, but if you need to leave, by all means leave um, and I'll finish this and it'll be in the video. And uh, um, I don't know if I feel like it, I can uh, um, give you back the three minutes later. Okay. All right, so now what we do is we make one final rotation and we rotate again, the body frame into the spatial frame, okay? So I have uh, S1, S2, and then S3 sticking out of the plane. And what I'm going to do now is I'm gonna take the disc and I'm gonna kind of just flatten it out onto the plane. Okay, now you might say, uh, rightly, uh, that when I do that, I've kind of now violated this constraint, but I'm not actually trying to move the body in any way according to uh, the constraints of the system. All I'm trying to do is I'm trying to relate the spatial frame, sorry, the spatial frame to the body frame. Okay, and I can do whatever I want to make that happen. Okay, so I'm going to rotate my disc so that it's flat like this okay and then upon doing that uh, what am i going to have i'm going to have b1 like this so this will be b1 triple prime uh, and then i'm going to have b2 triple prime like this and then sticking out i'm going to have uh, b3 triple prime and the point is is that the triple prime frame is exactly the spatial frame and that's what i wanted to do right i wanted to rotate the body frame into the spatial frame Okay, all right. Okay, now about which spatial axis is this a rotation? Okay, so I've rotated now. Uh, so this is gonna be uh, R3, okay. And so I've rotated uh, uh, this one into this one. So about which spatial axis am I rotating? S1 is the correct answer, right? Um, uh, and is this a rotation by, and it's a rotation, first of all, by 90 degrees, right? So by pi over two, right? Um, and is this a positive or a negative rotation? Well, again, I apply the right-hand rule and I see that this is a negative rotation, right? So if I just do the thumb and finger business, it's a, a rotation by minus pi over two, okay? Oops. Okay, and so and now I'm, so this is a rotation about uh, S1, and so I know that I'm going to have this. Okay, and then I'm going to have, um, you know, cos thetas and sine thetas here. And theta in this case is equal to minus pi by two. Okay, so I here I have cosine of minus pi by two. What's the cosine of minus pi by two? Okay, so I get a zero there. And the sine of minus pi by two? One. Um, the sine of minus pi by two. Uh, minus one? Yeah, that's right, okay. Okay, and so for our rotations about the 
first spatial axis, um, I get minus, oh, sorry, I, I'm, uh, let me, I'm gonna correct that. Um, so this is uh, um, minus sine theta here and sine theta here. So actually it's minus sine theta. So the plus should be here and the minus should be there. So it's minus minus one, okay? And I know that uh, B A triple prime is equal to S A is equal to R three B A um, double prime. Okay, and so then I know that S A therefore is equal to. Um, so I just now take these three formulae and I multiply them together, right? Um, I get that it's R, whoops, R3, R2, R1, B, A. Okay, so this is the, the now I, so I do the product of these, th these three things. Okay, uh, and this, um, it's not gonna be my, uh, 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 and, so, and so therefore what I get is I get that um, therefore, R is equal to, um, um, so if you invert this relationship, so maybe let me write that down, sorry. Okay, so I get that B A is equal to R1 transpose, R2 transpose, R3 transpose, S A, okay. And then this means that um, uh, R is equal to R1 transpose, R2 transpose. R3 transpose, okay? Um, and so now all, all that remains to do is the matrix multiplication, okay? And I think most of you have never had me in a class before, but if you did, you would know that I will never ever do more matrix multiplication in front of you, okay? Uh, you can very well do that on your own. Right, but it turns it into a routine process. Okay, so you get some. Uh... Okay, so I'm going to stop there. We're not quite done with this example yet because we also need to do um, uh, little r, but I'll do that next time. It's very simple. Okay, all right. So sorry, for, uh, sorry, I was a little bit late, but uh, um, it's one of the benefits of these video formats. So I'm going to quit the recording.